Hello and welcome to this new episode of Not So Fast. In this episode, what we are going to discuss is basically whether complex numbers um, exist and, uh, you know, in some sense, um, and in particular, focus on one particular uh, representation um, of complex numbers. Um, so first of all, where would this particular um, question come from? Well, if you look at uh, various uh, questions that, uh, that crop up on the internet, uh, essentially is this thing about do complex numbers really exist? Now, of course, you can uh, ponder about what the word really kind of, uh, or exist actually mean. Um, but the point here is that this is a very, very common question that I you know, remember even when I was uh, learning uh, complex numbers and it was always about, oh, but do they really exist? Is it just some kind of mathematical uh, trick and so on? And that basically doesn't make any sense in the real world or in the world of mathematics uh, for that matter. Um, and so the, the main problem is the following. So um, I guess the terminology as well uh, is a bit confusing. So there is this so-called imaginary number. And of course, calling it imaginary um, uh, you know, invokes in everybody's mind something that does not exist, that somehow in, it's just in our mind. Um, it's called I. Um, and it is the solution to the equation i squared is equal to minus 1. Now, the thing is um, that um, if you look at the rules of multiplication and therefore squaring in, for example, the integers or uh, in the reals, then you're going to find that there is no uh, solution to that equation in uh, basically these spaces. Okay. Now, the thing is that, of course, in mathematics, based on real numbers, uh, there are plenty of other spaces where perhaps this equation uh, makes sense and has a solution. And that's what we are going to look at. So we are going to look at a specific case uh, where uh, this can make sense. So um, this particular um, example is that of the space of two by two real matrices. And so the way they are going to, uh, to work is basically there is M here, that's a matrix, and this is simply an array of four, number, uh, four numbers, real numbers, so each are real numbers, A, B, C, and D, um, and then it follows various rules. And I'm starting here with the rules of multiplication of a matrix by uh, another real number, which is here called lambda. Um, so you can ask how that works. The way I'm going to, to put it together is basically by highlighting the lambda and then showing where it actually uh, occurs upon multiplication. And so the way it works is that if you multiply a matrix by a, a real number, then every component or every number, if you will, in that matrix is going to be multiplied by lambda. So that's how that, that function uh, here. Now, there, are, uh, there is another operation, actually quite complicated uh, uh, initially, so it could be quite strange to, to start with it, uh, but uh, that is quite important in terms of the properties uh, of a matrix. And the way it works in terms of uh, what it means is essentially you need to conceive, uh, as I've depicted here, you need to conceive the matrix as being made of two uh, column vectors, so one that I call U, so bold font U, which is AC, and another one V, uh, bold font V, uh, which is B and D. And then you can try to wonder uh, about putting these vectors graphically, for example, onto a grid like this. Um, and then you um, can try to uh, determine the area, actually, which is made out of the parallelogram uh, formed by these two vectors. So you want to find this particular area. And the point here is, how do you do it in the first place? Well, one thing you notice is that this uh, particular area is strictly contained in this large rectangle here. So, uh, on, so basically, the size of that rectangle is on the x-axis S A plus B, and on the y-axis C plus D. So the area in white here is basically A plus B times C plus D. Now, of course, we need to subtract stuff because there is all of this uh, white area and here this one, which is basically in surplus. So we need to subtract it. So let's focus first uh, on uh, these particular uh, triangles. 
Now these triangles have uh, each area BD over 2 uh, and therefore uh, basically if we subtract them we are going to get uh, basically minus uh, BD uh, here. Now we can focus on these uh, other triangles. So these ones have an area AC uh, over 2 um, and so each, so basically by subtracting both of them we are going to get minus AC and finally there is this particular rectangles uh, left um, and these ones have an area which is each uh, CB and so I need to subtract then minus 2CB. Now if I actually expand the parentheses and subtract all of these terms I get that the area is AD uh, minus BC. So essentially this is the definition uh, of the determinant. Uh, now because A can in principle be negative and all these things, essentially what you get out of this determinant is a so-called signed uh, area um, that is drawn by the corresponding parallelogram, uh, if you will, uh, of these vectors. So that's for the definition of the determinant. Now um, let's move on to uh, the addition. So how do you add up two matrices? So let's say here we've got a matrix, a matrix with um, basically all ones uh, indices, and here a matrix with all twos uh, indices. Um, so just to again make, say, make things a bit simpler, I'm trying to provide some coloring where each component is of the same color if they are at the same location in the matrix. So A1 is the upper left um, uh, component, um, so in, in cyan color, um, then in magenta you would have the upper right, then in orange the bottom left, and then in yellow you would have the uh, bottom right. Um, so the way it works for the addition is simply by um, adi uh, basically adding up, um, <coughs> sorry, component-wise. Um, so you add up component-wise these uh, different uh, elements of the matrix and you get basically A1 plus A2, B1 plus B2, C1 plus C2, and D1 plus D2. So it's fairly straightforward. Now what you can notice is that if you swap actually the order, so here I've put all the two indices here and the one indices there, you're going to get the same answer because the addition, uh, the normal addition of the real numbers is actually uh, commutative and this particular way of doing addition in terms of a component by component base uh, is going to uh, preserve this particular uh, commutation uh, property um, of the addition. And therefore, we've got that in general, we've got m1 plus m2 is equal to m2 plus m1. That's great. Now, let's look at something else. Uh, apart from the fact that the addition is commutative, let's look now at the multiplication. Now, it's a bit more complicated, and the way it works is also a bit more convoluted. So the way I'm going to do it, again, is by coloring various um, uh, elements of these matrices, but then differently from before. So the way I do it is basically the matrix, which is the leftmost one, I'm going to actually color uh, rows of that matrix and interpret these rows as being, for example, here, the transpose of a, of a column vector U1. And here, uh, this is again, the second row is interpreted as a transpose um, of a column vector V1. Um, likewise here, the rightmost matrix in the product is going to be uh, represented as uh, a set of column vectors that I call here W2 and X2. And the by definition, that's a construct, okay, by definition, the product, uh, the, matri the product of these two matrices uh, reads as such. So it's basically the uh, product, if you will, or the dot product, in fact, between U1 and W2, between U1 and X2, between V1 and W2, and V1 and X2. So that, that's essentially how, how you could interpret uh, these things. Now, of course, you can expand that and express everything in terms of A1, B1, etc. Uh, and this gives a, a slightly more complicated expression, which is like this. Now, at that point, uh, because it may look a bit complicated, you may want to stop uh, here and then uh, do, you know, look at what has been going on and uh, basically see what is happening in this particular operation. And then once you're confident that you understand what has happened here, then essentially you can, you know, resume the video. 
So what I want to discuss now is what happens if we swap uh, the two matrices. So the leftmost matrix now is the one with the two indices and the rightmost one is the one with the one indices. And if I actually do the same thing as before, I'm going to get different vectors. So here I'm going to get a vector that I'm going to call U2. So that's a transpose of U2. Here's a transpose of V2. And now a W1 and an X1 in column uh, version. If I calculate this, I get this particular expression. Now, you may not obviously remember by heart what we had before. So what I can do is actually put it together. So this is uh, basically the first matrix. Uh, so M1, if you will, times M2. And here this is M2 times M1. And what you see here is that, yes, there is the same first term for the first element. However, this is B1, C2 here, and here this is B2, C1. In principle, there is no reason why these two things should be the same. And essentially, wherever you look, you're going to find things like that. So A1, B2 has no reason to be equal to A2, B1, and so on and so forth. So in general, what happens is that you don't have M1, M2 that is uh, equal to M2, M1. Instead, they are, in general, different from each other. And so the multiplication uh, of, two, uh, of two by two matrices in general is non-commutative. Now, th this is in contrast with what happens with uh, real numbers, uh, where if you multiply two numbers, like let's say two times three, this is going to be equal to three times two. So that, that's, a, that's kind of a problem if you look at the operations that you can do in the space of these 2 by 2 matrices. Uh, there is this problem that essentially we, this is not commutative, and so we need to care about the exact details uh, about what's inside these matrices. Right, so the last uh, uh, part is that uh, the multiplicative, uh, the, this multiplication we've just defined has an actual identity, which I'm writing as bold font uh, 1. Uh, and essentially, this is commuted, commuting with any matrix. So M times 1 is equal to 1 times M. Uh, and that's equal to M by, by definition. Um, and so this matrix, uh, you can check for yourself, that is going to satisfy all of that, is actually this matrix with 1 along the diagonal and 0 anywhere else. Okay? So finally, what, what I want to say as well is that the, the space uh, of matrices, if you are into linear algebra, is actually a four-dimensional vector space. And so what that means is that essentially um, you've got M, uh, any matrix, uh, is going to be represented as a sum um, of, uh, as a linear, so-called linear combination of basically basis uh, vectors, so to speak. Um, and so here A, B, C, and D are the so-called components of this matrix. And then E1, E2, E3, and E4 are linearly independent uh, matrices. And so here, for example, there would be 1 and then 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, uh, 0, 0, 1, 0, and then 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay? So it's just to show a little bit in a very, very condensed version um, kind of the, what happens and what are the kind of operations we can do in a space of 2 by 2 real matrices. So now that we have seen that, uh, let's have a look at how to address the problem of i squared uh, is equal to minus 1. So um, it, here I'm going to put this as follows. I've got M uh, is equal to A, B, C, D, so that's the standard matrix we've looked at, and I want to find a solution to the equation M squared is equal to minus 1. Now, if I carry out the product uh, that I've mentioned earlier, so I say that M squared is actually equals to M times M, I'm going to get uh, this particular expression, um, and that gives uh, this. So it's A squared plus B, C on the top left, AB plus BD on the top right, CA plus DC on bottom left, and then CB plus D squared on the bottom right. Now, if you want to um, find actual solutions to it, then you're going to realize that you cannot um, ask B and C to be zero. So if you were to ask this thing, because that's something that could come from the your, your trying the resolution of it, you're going to end up with the normal uh, conundrum that you are going to re-square, to re-square, to, re 
to require that a squared is equal to minus 1 and d squared is equal to uh, minus 1, which are impossible to solve in the reals. Though you're going to find kind of no solution in that, uh, let's say, avenue. And so it turns out that the, there are two solutions uh, only to that equation, and these are the following ones. Uh, so they necessitate that b and c are non-zero, and actually um, a and d are zero. Uh, and so in that case, you will find that uh, there is first solution, which is s1, uh, which is, as you can see here, 0, minus 1, 1, 0, and then s2, and then 0, 1, minus 1, and then 0. Now, what we are going to do here, by the way, uh, you can pause if you want the video and check that both s1 squared and s2 squared uh, is equal to minus uh, the identity matrix. Uh, that's, that's, you know, that's something that could be uh, you know, uh, gratifying to do uh, to some extent. Um, so now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to select uh, one of the two and somehow arbitrarily, or at least conventionally, I'm going to select the one which is going to have the determinant which is uh, positive. And so in, in that case, in fact, uh, we, which is equal to, uh, to plus 1, um, and this one is actually S1. So I'm going to rename X1 um, bold font uh, I, and this is now 0 minus 1 and then 1, 0, and with the property that I squared is equal to minus 1. Now, of course, I renamed it that way because obviously it looks like the typical imaginary number that we are used to. Now, once we have seen that, then we can also wonder about cases where we've got a quadratic equation for a matrix, so in the space of 2 by 2 matrices, which has this particular form. So alpha m squared plus beta m and then plus gamma times the identity and that's equal to zero. And my question is, OK, uh, let's assume that I want to find solution of this, uh, but in the case where the so-called discriminant, so often uh, denoted delta, is equal to beta squared minus for um, alpha times gamma is less than zero, strictly less than zero. So usually, uh, uh, if you work in the reals, uh, or, or even more so, obviously, in the integers, uh, you're going to say that there is no solution to it because you will need to take essentially uh, the, like the square root um, of, of, a, of a negative number. Um, but in this particular case, you can actually do it uh, because you, you're going to take the square root uh, of a matrix which is minus the identity. Um, and so again, conventionally, we, we, we phrase it by using the i. Um, and, so, uh, and again, that's a definition, if you will, of the square root as defined in uh, um, in this larger space um, of matrices. And so what we get essentially is the following thing. We get that this matrix can be expressed as minus beta over 2 alpha times the identity and then plus the square root. So here that's the square root defined in the real numbers of minus delta um, and then divided by, uh, by 2 alpha. Okay, so that's basically what, what, what we are going to get um, here. Uh, and, and obviously times uh, i, so this matrix which is, uh, whose square can be negative. So that's basically what, uh, what we are going to get. And so what we can do is say, okay, let's look at the space of all these solutions. We see that these solutions have the form of a prefactor uh, some real fac factor times 1 or what, times the identity and then plus um, some other number times the imaginary number. And so this is quite interesting to look at the subspace that I'm going to call the complex uh, subspace of the 2 by 2 matrices uh, which is uh, essentially written as x times the identity matrix plus y uh, times the uh, imaginary, let's call it this way, uh, matrix. And so in general it has this particular form. I want to insist here that all of these numbers are real numbers, so x and y are real numbers. Now it, what is quite fascinating if you focus on that particular subspace of the 2 by 2 matrices, so that can be expressed in that fashion, uh, is the following. So first of all, this is a 2D real vector space because as you can see uh, there is a basis uh, which is here like fully determined and it's not meant to be changed so this is one of the identity and then the 
imaginary matrix. Um, then uh, if you look at products, then that's very interesting. If you try to take the product of then one, Z1 times Z2, then you're going to realize that because we've seen earlier that the identity matrix, like the multiplicative identity matrix, was commuting with any matrix, and because we know the property of I times I gives uh, minus the identity, essentially we can carry out this uh, particular uh, product without essentially uh, evolving any matrix. Um, and so we are going to get this particular outcome, x1, x2, minus y1, y2, times the identity matrix, plus x1, y2, plus y1, x2, times the imaginary uh, matrix. But interestingly, if you calculate z2 times z1, actually you get the same answer. And please, you can try to have a go at it, and by applying the rule again of the identity matrix uh, and then the imaginary one, you're going to get this um, um, in any case. And you can see that these are the same expressions. So what happens here is that essentially in this subspace, um, the, uh, uh, the product is actually commutative. Um, and so you've got that Z1 times Z2 is equal to Z2 uh, times Z1. And finally, the determinant of Z in that case is always going to be X squared plus Y squared. Uh, so essentially, almost telling us that this is the magnitude uh, of a vector, which would be uh, with components X and Y. So th this particular determinant is going to be called, uh, usually, the modulus uh, of Z. So what we see here is that essentially this um, uh, you know, subspace of matrices actually behaves like a space of numbers because uh, uh, essentially you can carry out operations of multiplications, additions, uh, squaring and all that. Uh, you can carry out all these operations without ever resorting to writing the matrices that, that correspond to these numbers. And so what it means is that uh, essentially what is going to matter here and the outcome of these operations is essentially the, some kind of more fundamental um, um, you know, algebraic structure uh, that is uh, embedded uh, into uh, these particular numbers, uh, into, the, into these particular kind of uh, ma matrix structures. Um, and this particular algebraic structure is what we call complex numbers, okay? Um, is basically the thing that has this structure that is provided, for example, by these two by two, the subspace of the two by two matrices. Uh, but the whole point here is to say that perhaps you could have many other uh, representations in other kind of spaces of this uh, complex number structure. Okay, so I hope um, that this particular little uh, video um, help you first to revise a bit on your uh, two by two matrices, uh, but also uh, could provide you with uh, an interpretation and a representation of matrices which somehow is grounded in the reals. Okay, so it's grounded in real numbers, but it's just that we are looking uh, in that case at arrays of real numbers. Uh, which basically have their place in obviously very, very uh, many situations in, in mathematics. Um, so uh, that's it for today's video, and then see you in the next one.